Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Horticultural oils provide a great way to control some insects without using heavy chemicals. Today we're going to look at the different kinds and how to apply them. Also, we'll talk about the bugs you want in your garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. And Tanya Ashworth will be joining me later. All right, Mr. D. So oils. We're going to talk about oils. Let's That's talk about correct. oils. It's a lot of different kind of oils out there. Uh, they, uh, there are oils that are called superior oils, uh -huh. uh, which you're probably familiar with, but they really aren't. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're inferior oils because they're not as effective as uh, the more highly refined horticultural oils. They, uh, the highly refined horticultural oils are 98% pure. They're less likely to cause injury to new foliage and, uh -huh. and to sensitive plants than the superior oils. However, uh, and many of the superior oils are plant-based. Uh, they can be soybean oil, canola oil, sesame seed oil. Uh, uh, neem oil is neem oil, an example right. of a, 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 also a plant-based oil. Uh, we're going to actually, I'm going to mix up some neem oil and demonstrate how to, to, to use it. Uh, primarily because neem oil, <coughs> excuse me, neem oil also has uh, fungicidal activity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially on powdery mildew. And uh, if uh, you get a, do a good job of, of, of coverage, then you can have some control there. Uh, How about the mode of action of the oil? Mode of action, right. right. They primarily work by stopping up the spiracles or the breathing tubes of insects right. and uh, smothering the eggs mm -hmm. as the primary mode of control. But it also, as a mode of action, it, it can disrupt cell membranes, right. causing the insect or egg to, to desiccate right. and dry out. And uh, so it actually has two modes of action that, that it's uh, uh, where it's working, but uh, it is imperative that you get 100% yeah. control. You have to have complete control of, yeah. of uh, or complete coverage to get complete control uh, of, uh, of uh, the insects and so eggs that no you're trying to kill. there's no residual with the oil? Absolutely no residual. Yeah. Uh, and one of the problems, but a benefit, is uh, if you're trying to, to uh, if mites or, or mite eggs are, are, are one of your targets you're trying you're trying to kill, uh -huh. you're also going to kill the beneficial mites. Ah. However, because you have no residual, beneficials can come back in there and they can hopefully build up oh, faster than the bad ones gotcha. can. Gotcha. But yeah. uh, it doesn't have any. It, it, they're contact only. It's a contact uh, insecticide, which again is why you have to have contact right. to uh, to. Uh, uh, get control. You know these trees that we're standing around here. I'm going to do a demonstration on the bark okay. just to show how to uh, make sure you get good penetration and good coverage. Okay. But I wouldn't be trying to. The only <laughs> way I would try to spray these trees is with a helicopter or an air blast sprayer <laughs> or something like that, right. because only what I spray is has any any coverage. And on a That's tree like this, it's one percent. Uh, right. The neem oil that we've got here, I uh, looked at the label and it's two, we, we've got a gallon of water right. already in the sprayer. Gallon. And uh, the neem oil is, uh, I think, two uh, two tablespoons per gallon of water. Okay. And I just happen to have a tablespoon here. You notice I'm not wearing rubber gloves. I see gloves. you don't have gloves. Right. I don't wear rubber, I'm not wearing rubber gloves. And if you see me mix up any other pesticide, I've always worn rubber gloves. Yeah, right. But uh, the reason is uh, the hortic all of the horticultural oils have no mammalian toxicity. They're right. very safe. And and uh, so I'm not worried about, okay. you know, getting poisoned. I, I'm not going to try to inhale the, <laughs> the uh, 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 spray mist. Yeah. So oh, that probably wouldn't do me any good, but uh, they are, they're very safe, very safe to use. Uh, many plants, there are quite a few plants that are, can, that are susceptible or can be damaged by horticultural oil. So it's very important that you read the label and yes. follow the label right. instructions with horticultural oil, just, just like you would uh, any other pesticide. Okay. But we're going to, we're going to put one tablespoon in here. Uh. And that was a little bit more. So I'll try to do a little bit less a little here. Less. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. There you go. I think that'll work. That works. I'm going to shake that up good. The oil, oils are, you know, inherently don't like to mix with water. Yeah. So it's pretty important that you, if you're spraying an oil that you've mixed with water, that you mix, shake it up, you keep it agitated because if it settles out, you may be just spraying water and the water's not going to do you any good. Or you may be spraying 100% oil, which could, which could damage your foliage, right. you know, or damage your plant. Yeah, burn it. Mm -hmm. so, I'm going to go down here. Okay. Pump it up. They guess got. too. We need to be mindful of what wind, temp, you know, right. wind direction. Right. And yeah. Speed. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to spray yourself. Right. You don't want the wind to blow it on you. Okay. Uh, the finer the droplet, the better. Okay. And I don't, I haven't, let's see what we've got here. That's pretty fine. Okay. So I'm going to make sure I get in on both sides of the crevices here. Just spray to the point of runoff. It doesn't need to, you don't want it to drip. You want okay. to make sure you get it wet. Uh, it's important to uh, not spray when the temperature is below 40 degrees and don't spray when the temperature is greater than 90 degrees. It's best if the humidity is low because uh, uh, higher humidity can create problems. It's good if you can spray on a bright, sunshiny day, but if you're out there spraying and you get a little light rain, that's not gonna be a problem because the oil's gonna repel it. And again, mm -hmm. you said this is, has contact activity. It's right? a contact, yeah. contact insecticide or, or fungicide. It even on the, on the powdery mildew, it just kills the spores because by coming in contact. Now I'm going to get over here on this side. Okay. And it, and as as good as the coverage is, as good as this coverage is, even within that bark, there are probably some insect eggs and some scale insects yeah. and mite eggs that are are not protected. So I may have to come back, and uh, you may have to treat more than once you know a couple of weeks later you may want to come back again but then you also have to keep in mind that uh, the dormant rate is for when the plants are dormant uh, horticultural oils mm -hmm. you can also spray them because they're more highly refined you can spray them during the growing season however your rate per gallon of water will be lighter during the growing season than during the dormant season most of the time the horticultural oils uh, the rate is a two to three percent uh, ingredient, uh, a two, two to three percent uh, solution. And uh, with this neem oil that we mixed up, that was probably only about a one percent solution. So okay. it was a little bit lighter. This is lighter. Right. Yeah. But uh, it's very important that you check your label. Uh, I know uh, red maples, Japanese maples, uh, walnuts, hickories are, are, are you can't spray with oils, they're, they're susceptible. And, and there's quite a few, more plants than you would think, yeah. that, uh, that can be burned. Right, with probably these like oils. evergreens and things like that. A lot, for of, sure. evergreens. Yeah, a lot of evergreens. You pretty much need to avoid green tissue right. you know, if okay. you can. Except for the, the plants that can tolerate it. Right, and sure. The plants that can tolerate it in the summertime, you know, you, you go okay as long as you go with a lighter rate. Lighter rate. That's the According to the label. According to the label. Right, According label. to the label. Follow Appreciate label. that demonstration, Mr. D. Okay, good deal. Right. All right, so we have another winter annual weed. This would be wild violets or Johnny jump ups. Uh, they have waxy cuticles, so they can be very difficult to control. Uh, they have beautiful flowers. Some of the flowers are purple, they have a little white in them, some are actually pink as well. Uh, so again, winter annual weeds, if you want to control them, you have to use a broadleaf weed killer. Or if you don't want to control them, they're beautiful flowers. Again, we're the one that call them weeds. They're actually nature's wildflowers. All right, Tanya, let's talk a little bit about beneficial bugs. But first, what do we mean by beneficial? 
Well, a beneficial bug or beneficial insect is a, a bug that helps you reach your goals in the garden. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pollinators. We think of immediately our, our bees that are good pollinators, so they're beneficial to us. And also we have a lot of bugs that kill other bugs that we don't like. Okay. So um, we have bugs that eat the bugs that would eat our vegetables. Okay. So you want to start with the braconid wasp? Sure. Right. Um, the braconid wasp is very a common thing to be seen in the garden, but most people don't know when they've seen uh, evidence of the mm -hmm. braconid wasp. Usually you'll find these on tom tomato hornworms sure. on your tomato plants. You'll see all these little white egg sacs mm -hmm. on the back of the caterpillar and the braconid wasp, even though it's a wasp, it will not sting you. They're very tiny, like a, an eighth of an inch, so very small. The female lays her eggs on the back of caterpillars, mm. moths, um, beetle larvae, and some aphids. And when those eggs hatch, the larvae eat the host, the tomato hornworm or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, after they are done eating, the bad bug dies and the <laughs> beneficial, the new beneficials fly away to infect more of your pests. So if you see a tom tomato hornworm that has all of these little white egg sacs on the back. You don't want to mm -hmm. squish it. Um, you want to leave it there so that it can um, provide food for those good bugs. You can also attract them in your garden by growing certain things like dill, parsley, okay. wild carrot, and yarrow. Um, in general, any kind of little, a little herb with small flowers, uh, those the adult wasps like to use for nectar. Wow, small flowers. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. Now let's talk uh, about green lacewing. Okay, the green lacewing, um, the larvae are the ones that feed on the pests in this okay. case. They like aphids, mealybugs, caterpillars, scales, thrip, and whiteflies. So That's a lot, lot of the things yeah. that we yeah. don't like, they like to munch on. Right. The female will lay her eggs on a slender egg stalk and she can lay about 200 eggs at a time right. on, these, on these stalks. And one larva that emerges from that will eat 200 aphids in a week. So they're called aphid lines. They're really hungry, <laughs> hungry guys. In a week. In a week, 200 oh, aphids. And Amazing. they will feed for two to three weeks before they go into a cocoon and then five days later they emerge. Okay. Um, you can plant some things to attract them to your garden like Angelica, Coreopsis, Cosmos, and Sweet Alyssum. And you can also mail order those egg stalks with the, the eggs. Okay. Um, so yeah, the green lacewing uh, are very beneficial. You don't want to, you don't want to spray those with an insecticide. And in fact, um, a good rule of thumb is, you know, when you spray an insecticide, you oftentimes kill the beneficials with the ones that you're trying to get rid of. Good so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, unless you use BT because it's specific to caterpillars, but good. if you use a broad spectrum insecticide, you're gonna kill all of your good with your bad. So you want to be careful in how you use those. Good information to share, Tanya. Good information. How about this next one though, a pirate bug? Yes, How about that? minute pirate bugs. Yeah. Kind of a fun name. Yeah, that's um, fun. They're very small, uh, a twelfth to a fifth of an inch long. That's where they get the minute from. Yeah, very small. small, and they're black and white in color. The immature stages are um, very small. They're kind of teardrop shaped and brown and orangey colored. The adults and the nymphs will both. Um, be predators for thrips, spider mites, aphids, and their eggs. Mm. And an adult will eat 30 spider mites a day. So um, they're quick moving. They'll attack just about anything though, not just those particular pests that we like to get rid of. And the way they um, attack their prey is they have a piercing sucking mouth part. Mm. So they'll use that mouth part to inject into their prey and then they will suck the juices out of the prey. Yee. Yuck, but that's how <laughs> they do it. Um, they can go from an egg to adult in three weeks, and they have three generations per season. And this is another one that you can buy online. Okay. Um, and they're actually a really good uh, predatory bug if you've got a greenhouse, and they may be more effective than, than others. And if you want to try to just encourage them to come to your garden, you can plant goldenrod, daisies, mm -hmm. um, alfalfa, yarrow, mm -hmm. clover, and vetch. Okay. All right. So how about this next group of beneficial bugs? Spiders? Spiders, really? spiders, yes. Well, they're not technically an insect. We talk uh -huh. about beneficial insects. Uh -huh. They're not technically an insect because they have eight legs instead of six, so okay. they're an arachnid. 
Um, but not all spiders build a web to, mm -hmm. to catch their prey. In fact, the ones in our garden that are beneficial, they hunt their prey. So we have uh, wolf spiders, yes. jumping spiders, and crab spiders. And the wolf spiders, I know every gardener has seen, they mm -hmm. live along in the leaf litter, in the mulch, and whenever you're turning your garden over mm -hmm. or doing any kind of weed, and you'll find them there, they're kind of the large brown spiders with the stripes on their backs. Yeah, large. Yes. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> and they carry yeah. around, the mama spider carries around her eggs with her where she goes, and after her young emerge for two weeks, she'll carry her young on her back. Mm -hmm. And they um, hunt at night in the leaf litter. Um, then we have the jumping spider. <laughs> the jumping spider, even though they don't use a web, they'll use a strand of silk to tether themselves mm -hmm. to a leaf, and then they'll jump on and attack their prey. And then the crab spiders <laughs> have a lot uh, enlarged front front legs, yeah. and that's where they get the name crab spider from. Right. And they like to hang out on flowers and hunt for their prey from flower petals. And they can even turn colors, change colors a little bit to camouflage against the flowers. Oh, how about that? Yeah, not pretty fair. cool. Yeah, pretty yeah not fair. Not fair. <laughs> They're good hunters. Pretty good. All right, so how about the praying mantis? We've all heard about the yeah. praying mantis. Well, the praying mantis are really cool they looking bugs. Cool. Um, of course, they get their names from their big front legs mm -hmm. that they use to grab their prey while they munch. And they can be um, really good at camouflaging themselves against mm -hmm. twigs and sticks and all that kind of stuff. They like to um, lay their egg cases in like this paper mache looking mm -hmm. thing. Um, actually bought a tree recently and it had one of these oh. egg cases okay. on it. So that was pretty cool. That's cool. And the egg case will have like up to 200 baby praying mantis in there. Okay. And you won't even know that they've hatched. You can't tell the difference when it, when, um, you can't look at the egg case and tell if they've hatched or not. You just have to happen to see a baby praying <laughs> mantis somewhere. And that's how you know that you've had a hatch. Wow. So you can buy them on the internet and put them in a greenhouse or in a garden setting, but you won't know if they've hatched or not unless you just so happen to see the babies. And these mm. take five months to mature mm. and um, they can lay up to five egg cases in their lifetime. And they like to eat pretty much anything that will catch their attention. They're pretty slow moving. And um, yeah, so they'll grab anything, like another beneficial insect even, they'll oh. grab, like bees and other oh. praying mantis. So they're not real particular on what they eat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty tough. I've never seen a baby one though. Have I you? haven't either, except oh. like on the internet. Um, you can like look up okay. video of these things hatching out of their egg case. It's cool. really pretty cool. All right. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. So once again, folks, be careful when you're using pesticides mm -hmm. out in the garden, right? Because we do have beneficials out there that will help us. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. Thank you much for that good information, Tony. We Thanks. appreciate that. Yes, I was asked to come out and investigate this wound on this tree right here. And we had three magnolias here in a row and they're all showing the same signs. Uh, it's a lesion that runs up and down the trunk of the tree and I have a, a strong background in fungus with trees and I have to assume that this is a canker disease. A canker disease uh, affects different trees in different ways and there's different types of cankers. This one in particular right here appears to be what I believe to be an inanatus fungus. It's a white rot and the white rot affects the phloem tissue of the tree and then also the cambium and then it gets real soft on the heartwood of the tree and that's what's telling me that it's probably an inanatus type canker. The best way to treat this type of canker is to cut it out and treat your tools with a with bleach, a nine to one mixture of bleach and treat the wound of the tree in hopes of not spreading the disease. If it is not treated, if it's left alone, it will eventually kill the tree. Okay, now I want to take this tree apart. This section, this appears to be the only section of the tree that is infected. So we're going to eliminate it. And for safety reasons, I want to prune up above the first wound. No need to sterilize my tools yet because I'm only cutting out infected parts of the tree. This section right here is dead. You can see how the canker grew around this collar. And a lot of times that's where the wound sets in. We see the canker on the outside, 
but how it affects the tree on the inside, the decay continue, continues to, to move its way into the wood. Uh, eating away that phloem tissue, which the phloem tissue is what carries the nutrients from the foliage down, and then eating away at the cambium, which produces the new tissue of the tree. Now, on this final cut, I am going to spray my tools right here because we're getting down to the part of the wood that we're going to leave. This is a nine to one mixture of bleach. And we're gonna cut it off at ground level. Get a nice clean cut. The, the phloem tissue and the xylem tissue is still active right now before the wound starts closing over or compartmentalizing. And treating it with this bleach, we hope to stop the disease from spreading. Here's our Q&A segment. You ready, Mr. D? Let's do it. We got some good questions here. Yep. All right, here's our first viewer email. What do you use to spray azalea lace bugs? Wayne in Oakland, Tennessee. The old azalea lace bugs, and they can be a problem. They can. They can really be a problem. Be a problem. And when you spray, you know, they're on the underside of the leaf. <laughs> so you, get, you, so you just right. spray a little bit on top of the plant, you're not going to do any good. No good. But, uh, yeah, they're on the underside of the leaf. You need to make sure you do a good job of spraying. Unless, Unless. <clears throat> you go with a drench. Ah. And uh, this is the time of the year that you can do that. Uh, according to Red Book, <laughs> UT's Red Book, uh -huh. and this is 2018, variety. Right. Uh, information is still good. Drenched with Safari, mm -hmm. Xylem Liquid, Merit, or Marathon uh, mm -hmm. as a drench, as an alternative to foliar sprays. And you do that, you know, this time of the year, you know, late winter and early, early, early spring. Early spring. If you uh, miss that, then you can go with foliar sprays. Okay. And there are a lot of those. Dimethoate, Orthene, Discus, Tempo, Diazinon, Decathlon, Merit, Tempo, SC, Ultra, Marathon Flagship, Durzban 50W, I'm not Ooh. sure that's still on the market, yeah. Safari, Xylem Liquid, Arena, uh, Seal Print, and Botana Guard, and that's any time from April to October. Okay, and that's the that. foliar spray. That's the foliar Good spray. Good coverage with that, please. Right. 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 But uh, it's best to go with the, the get, them, get them early, nip them in the bud. Nip them in the bud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, underside of the leaves, folks. If you spray. If you spray. With if the you're doing the spray. drench, just, you don't have to worry about spraying. That's just right. On the ground. And they're definitely a problem. Okay. I've seen more azalea lace bugs on azaleas that are not in the right place. So if they're, they're in the stressed. sun, they're stressed, they're going to yeah. have more azalea lace bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Right plant, right place, y'all. Yeah. Right. They like shade. All right, here's our next viewer email. My hardy gardenias leaves are turning yellow this winter. Should I wait till spring to fertilize? What can I do in winter, Irene, from YouTube. So gardenia leaves, yellow in the winter, could be a couple of different things, might have been a wet winter. That's what I'm thinking, yep. okay, wet winter. Yep. Uh, I would wait to see what happens and you can fertilize in the spring. Right, do not fertilize in the winter. Don't you fertilize know, You don't want to flush a new growth yeah. when you, you might get a hard freeze, right. you know, because that's bad. Yeah, but I'm betting there's moisture and gardenias like to be planted high. So you gotta have good drainage, good drainage. well drained soil. If not, yellow leaves. Right. Yeah. And I'll wait to the spring to fertilize. Hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have a problem with Bermuda grass in my asparagus bed. How can I get rid of it? Sprenda from YouTube. Bermuda, it's the old Bermuda grass, but it's in asparagus. Is there anything we can use? Yeah, there's a couple okay. of things you okay. can use. Uh, Mechanical removal is, is uh, <laughs> right. one thing is right, that's right. good. You know, use a hoe and, mm -hmm. and try to pull it out. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want to try to do that. But I, a post yeah. uh, is labeled in Fusilade. Uh, that's uh, Cethoxidem and Luzafop, Butyl, yeah. uh, Lorox, Linuron is also right. labeled okay. for uh, for asparagus. But that's probably about it uh, on a, in a post-emergent post situation. Right. Uh, you know, pre-emergent, you know, you can use uh, but pre-emergent Bermuda grass is not going to be, it's not going to come up before the asparagus right. spears come right. up. So really, yeah. you know, I mean, if you have other uh, weeds, you could go with a Roundup or Paracot or Moxone if you have, if you have a certificate. Now you right, have, to right, have a certificate right. in a lot of states That's right. That's right. to use. Uh, well, it's a, Gramoxone has always been a restricted-use pesticide. Uh, 
So, but now there's further restrictions on using it. Uh, so I probably would forget about that as a homeowner. But okay. uh, gl uh, glyphosate is, is uh, for pre-emergent before the spears come up. All right. Uh, is, is okay for some of those weeds. But Bermuda grass, it's gonna come out later. Yeah, it's later. The spears are gonna be up and that leaves you for those three. Okay, yeah. mechanical yeah. method is probably- Mechanical, yeah. any time, mechanical, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, hope that helps you out, it's Brenda. Mm -hmm. Here's our next viewer email. Is it too late to prune my pear tree since it has blooms on it? When should I have pruned them? This is Gloria in Memphis, Tennessee. So that's the question you like, right? About your uh, yeah. pear tree. Yeah. Right. You know, it, it doesn't. It is not too late to prune when they're blooming. As yeah. a matter of fact, okay. that is a good time to prune. Good time. Okay. Uh, you know, ideally, you probably would have pruned right before they started blooming. But pear trees start blooming so quick, you don't want to prune within 48 hours of a hard uh, freeze. Yeah. If a hard freeze is forecast, hold off the pruning. But yeah, during bloom is not a problem. Just be careful and don't let a honeybee sting you. Because <laughs> you, you're, 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 right. you know, they're going to be buzzing That's around right. there probably uh, if, it's a, if it's a warm day. But, you know, it's time, time to do it. Time to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. There you have it, Miss Glory. All right, Mr. D. Again, those are good questions. All right, they are. Great questions. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to find out more about horticultural oils or any of the good bugs Tanya talked about, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. While you are there, you can learn about hundreds of other garden topics. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.